Commander 788 here. Great action figure. So great. Top tier. Love G.I. Joe. Great. I'm in hell. Slaughter Rising. Strike, strike. Wait a minute. Ready. 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 Silent kill. Everybody, Hood of Cobra Commander 788 here, and welcome to the first video of 2017. We made it to 2017, and what is our first review of the year? The Terror Drone. The Terror Drone. I picked this up at JoeCon, but I didn't tell anybody. I wanted it to be a surprise. Some of you guys saw me there. Maybe you noticed me carrying out a box that was as big as I was. Well, that's what it was. This continues a new tradition on this channel of reviewing something big for the first video of every year. Last year, the first video that we did was the biggest of the big, the USS Flag. This year, well, it's not quite so big. Nothing is quite so big, but it's still pretty big. I will also be looking at the vehicle that came with the Terradrome, the Firebat, and the Pilot, the AVAC. That will all be in this video. So let's start 2017 off right and get some momentum that will carry us through this next year. We've got a lot of great things to look at this year and the Terradrome is pretty great. So HCC 788 presents the Terradrome. Here it is, the Cobra Terror Drome and the Firebat and the AVAC action figure. The Terror Drome, the Firebat, and the AVAC were first available in 1986 and were also available in 1987 and were discontinued for the year 1988. In 1988, the Firebat was reissued as a mail away offer in a different color and the AVAC figure was included with it. We are going to take a close look at the Firebat and the AVAC figure later in this video, but first we're going to take a tour around the Terradrome. Just one quick note, the Terradrome as you see it here is not resting flat on the table. I have it sitting on a Lazy Susan so I can turn it uh, to gain access all the way around. I will be using the blueprints that came with the instruction sheet for the Terradrome to describe some of the features on this playset. Let's start by looking at the top level of the Terradrome. The TV commercial for the Terradrome suggested that this top level would turn, but it does not. This is the reinforced heavy armor Cobra Battle Rampart, and these are often broken. The plastic is thinner and more brittle than I would prefer. In fact, I'd say that of basically the whole playset. All the way around, the plastic feels a bit thin and a bit brittle. In fact, on this Terradrome, there's a chip taken out of it here. Uh, and you'll see that a lot with terror drones. It can be difficult to find one that uh, doesn't have any broken parts. The Rampart has this beautifully sculpted Cobra emblem on it, and credit to Hasbro for sculpting these on rather than giving us just big Cobra stickers. Uh, there are six total Ramparts that go around the playset. Also on the top level, we have two tower-mounted white heat laser cannons. White heat? These massive turrets will rotate and the laser cannons will elevate on a ratchet. This ratchet effect can wear out over time, so you may run into pterodromes with floppy cannons. On the back side of the laser cannon, we have a lot of room. You could fit more than one figure on here. And we have a chair with a back peg, and this chair is similar but not identical to the chair that came with the USS flag. In case anyone is wondering, the USS flag chair will fit on the pterodrome, sort of, but uh, only at an angle. The gun turret also has some nice detail, some instrument panel stickers, very well done, and this instrument panel here is attached to the gun, so it, it will actually elevate with the gun. Just really nicely done, very good gun turrets. Here's what the gun turret looks like manned by a Cobra Viper. I guess my biggest complaint would be the gunner sits so far back that he can't reach the control panel, but that's a minor problem. We'll just imagine that the gunner is controlling the gun using the force. Behind 
behind the ramparts and the gun turrets we have this command center and the command center has computer control panels all along the outside wall. There are three different types of computer panel and they are just repeated all the way around. You have this smaller one, you have this one with the radar screens on it, and then you have this larger one with gauges and dials on it. There are four of these radar screen panels and two of the smaller ones and two of the larger ones for a total of eight. Each of the radar screen control panels has a chair in front of it and this is a reclining chair. Not sure why they included that feature but there you go. These chairs can pop out very easily and they have some nice detail on them. Uh, they have a joystick right here uh, and these can break off so watch out for that. And there are four of these chairs in total. If I have one complaint about these chairs it's that the seat is a bit narrow and doesn't fit the televiper very well. I would like the televiper to be in these command seats but the televiper has pockets sculpted on his legs and they're just a little bit too wide for these narrow seats so he sits a little bit awkwardly in these command chairs. Before we move on here is just a tour of that outer ring of the command center at the top level of the pterodrome and all those computer panels and the positions that they're in. Now let's look at what is probably the most important feature on this playset the launch silo and the launch silo blast doors. As you can see the doors are segmented and form a dome when the doors are closed and we have a large cobra emblem that can be seen on the dome. The launch bay doors are activated by a lever that is behind the door that is the farthest from the gun turrets so you could consider this to be the back door if you consider the gun turrets to be on the front side of this round base. The door for the lever is marked with a little notch right here so you'll know you have the right one. Open the door by gently pulling down on this tab and you have the silo door mechanism. When the lever is in the up position the silo doors are closed you can open the silo doors by pulling the lever down. Here's what that silo door opening looks like from the top side and not only does it open the silo doors, it also raises the platform for the fire bat. The silo door mechanism is driven by this chain which connects the lever to the platform and you have to exercise some care because that connection can wear out over time. I mean you have metal connected to plastic and that plastic is going to be weaker than metal. So do be careful about that. Looking at the platform we can see how the fire bat rests in there. It has these two clips and those clips connect to these back wings on the fire bat and these wheels there uh, fit in these cups right here. So the fire bat really only fits on the platform one way. Placing the fire bat on the platform does require a little bit of force to get those wings to fit on those clips. Uh, so be very cautious about that. Try not to put any unnecessary pressure on the chain connection. Then of course you can close the doors again by pushing the lever back up. Here's what the silo door closing looks like from the top side. Rounding out our look at the top section of the pterodrome, what we basically have here is an open air command center. It has some slotted vents along the inner ring of the command center and that's a nice detail. It does not have any doors or hatches or ladders that lead to the lower section. It also doesn't have any protection for personnel from the blast when the fire bat takes off. What it does have is plenty of foot pegs so you can have lots of cobra figures manning this command center with each easy access. Here is the pterodrome with its full complement of cobra figures. This is with a figure in every chair and on every foot peg and honestly there's plenty more room here. You could fit a lot more figures in here if you wanted to. It is a testament to Hasbro's commitment to G.I. Joe that they gave us a bad guys playset of this size and quality. Very well done guys. The lower level of the pterodrome has eight sections with eight outer walls and each of these walls opens up so they are also doors. There are two types of doors. There's the standard door with this triangular protrusion and this opens by pulling down on this latch and it opens downward. This latch is very thin plastic and easily broken so be careful. There are six of these standard doors. The clips that hold the door to the base are also fragile so be extremely cautious when assembling or disassembling the pterodrome. There's a bonus hidden feature on these standard doors. These triangular protrusions perfectly fit the 1984 Cobra claw powered glider. Just wedge the claw right on there and it works really well. It probably was not designed for that purpose but it's a nice use for it. Uh, and so you know you could put a few claw powered gliders on there 
and I think it works really well. I think it even enhances the look of the Terradrome itself. It adds some color interest, and I think it just looks cool to have these uh, winged gliders hanging on to the side of the Terradrome uh, like bats on the side of a cave. Uh, just really cool looking. The other type of door is the gun turret door. There are two of them. One of them is on this side, and the other one is way around over here on this side. There are four rooms between them, and these doors open by swinging to the side like this. The gun turret is pretty simple. You have the double-barreled gun with a couple caps on the end of the barrels, and the gun will elevate, but it will not pivot, but you can swing the door itself to aim it. Uh, the gun uh, goes through the inside of the door, uh, so the control panel will move with the movement of the gun. You have some sculpted instrument panel detail on the gun control panel, and of course that will move with the movement of the gun. And then you have a chair with a back peg, and this is the same type of chair uh, that you had on the upper gun turrets. It just slides right in there. And the chair itself is on a platform that connects to the door. Just slide your gunner into the chair and put the back peg in his back, and now he can fire the gun. I have to assume this is some kind of video screen here, because there's no portal for him to look out and see what he's shooting at. Then you have these red bars, and these are meant to be uh, like kickstands for the door, to hold the door open. Of course, mine doesn't reach the ground because my pterodrome is elevated because I have it on a turntable, uh, but it's meant to hold the door open when it's setting flat on the ground. Now, these don't really work well, and they're not very necessary. These are frequently missing parts, uh, and this red plastic is pretty notorious for being fragile, and so they end up getting broken a lot. So uh, these parts are things that if you don't really need the pterodrome to be complete, you could just uh, skip these. You won't really even notice that they're missing. I don't even really like to put them on the pterodrome because they are so fragile. I only put this one on uh, for the purpose of this review so you could see how it fits on, but I'm going to remove it and the other one on the other gunner's door uh, for the rest of this review because for this review I will be swinging these doors around and moving the pterodrome around and I just don't want these to get broken so I'm going to put them in a safe place. The pterodrome is a round base so it doesn't really have a front or a back. However, if you swing both of the turret doors open they swing and face the same direction and it's the same side that has both of the top gun turrets. So you could look at this as the front of the base that faces toward the enemy. Let's look at the interior of the pterodrome and since we have the gunner's door open let's go ahead and look at the gunner's room. Uh, the other gunner's room on the other side of the pterodrome is exactly the same. The details are the same so we'll just look at one of them to avoid redundancy. The room is wedge shaped and the back wall is the launch bay shaft and the interior walls we have a couple doors that lead to other chambers. There is a single foot peg but there isn't very much in this room and really there couldn't be because when the door is closed the gunner's seat will take up most of that space. Here's a closer look at some of the interior detail. There's some flooring detail there. There's a reminder not to smoke around the armaments. That's probably good advice. And then my favorite detail is this ammunition box that is affixed to the floor. Uh, that is a reuse of an earlier part from the 1984 mortar defense unit. They just reused the same thing as flooring detail for the pterodrome. And I think this is a clever reuse of parts. Uh, it is appropriate, so it works. Moving counterclockwise, the next room over is a refueling station. And in fact, the next two rooms are also refueling stations, and they are identical. As with the previous room, the other rooms all have open doors that allow movement between them. Since all three of these rooms are the same, right down to the placement of the foot pegs, I will just look at one of them. The refueling room is pretty plain. It has minimal detail. The most important part is this refueling platform in red plastic, which can slide out to be accessible by vehicles parked outside of the base. Attached to the refueling platform is a fuel pump on a long black hose, and it actually wedges in there, I think, too firmly, so be very cautious about pulling that out. Now, this refueling pump is the same as the one that came with the 1985 USS Flag refueling trailer. Uh, it is the same, except the one that came with the flag was gray, and the one that came with the pterodrome is a dark red. Starting in 1985, some G.I. Joe and Cobra vehicles had fuel ports sculpted on them. For example, this 1986 Cobra Stun had this fuel port on the side right there. 
So if you had the Terradrome, you could wheel the Cobra Stun right up to it, and then you could use the Terradrome's fuel pump to refuel it. And that's kind of cool, a nice little play feature, and it interacts with other vehicles. It works with some smaller vehicles as well. For instance, this 1985 Cobra Ferret ATV has a fuel port on it, and you can actually fit this on the platform, on the door right there, and you can refuel it that way. Uh, so this is not a bad feature uh, if this is the sort of thing you like to do with your playtime. Since there are three refueling stations, you can refuel fuel three vehicles at the same time. And if your Terradrome is on a shoreline, even the Cobra Moray Hydrofoil has fuel ports that are compatible with the Terradrome. The refueling room has two foot pegs, one on the floor and one on the sliding platform. Just to reiterate, that red plastic is pretty fragile, so be cautious when handling it. Moving past the three refueling rooms, we get to the first unique room in the Terradrome, the jail cell. The jail cell is just to the left of the other gun turret door. This prisoner containment chamber is a callback to the stockade that was in the 1983 G.I. Joe Headquarters Command Center. Of course, the G.I. Joe stockade was more humane than the Cobra jail cell. It had a couple beds for prisoners to lie down, and it had no roof on it for easy escape. There were no such amenities in the Cobra jail cell. You had a red sliding door that would completely enclose your prisoner in the jail cell. You had no beds or even seating room. It's standing room only in there. There are four foot pegs in the prisoner containment chamber, two on the inside of the cell and two on the outside of the cell. The foot pegs on the inside of the cell are difficult to reach, so I would recommend removing the cell wall and putting the figures in there if you want the figures on the foot peg, and then replacing the wall. It's just easier that way. Here's a closer look at the interior detail of the prisoner containment chamber. Some flooring detail there, not a lot, really pretty minimal detail. Once again, Again, we have doors that allow passageway to neighboring chambers and of course the reminder not to smoke. Then up here we have a sticker that gives us a caution that there's a force field in use. Moving past the jail cell we will skip over the second gun turret room. It's the same as the other one we looked at. The next room over is the room that contains the launch silo door mechanism and we've already seen how that works. Other than the silo door lever this room is virtually empty with very little detail. It does have a couple foot pegs right in front of the doorways and that's kind of where they need to be so they don't interfere with the big red lever. Moving on we get to the last room in the Cobra Terradrome and it is in fact an empty room. This final room really is empty. It has four foot pegs and really nothing else. This really is the only empty space in the Terradrome. The other rooms are all filled up with stuff. Even though the top level has plenty of space it also has computer panels and chairs and gun turrets and things to interact with. This chamber really has nothing. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The Terradrome seems to take the opposite approach from the USS Flag, which had several empty rooms that felt kind of blank, felt like they needed something in them. The Terradrome, on the other hand, only has this empty space and everything else is filled up. Having a single empty room in the Terradrome doesn't give the Cobra Legions much space to do whatever it is they do when they're not fending off a G.I. Joe attack. Things such as Cobra Commander getting down to 70s boogie, or Zartan contemplating his existential angst, or Destro and the Baroness practicing their clarinets, or, you know, whatever they do in their off hours. Now let's talk about the vehicle that came with the Terradrome, the Firebat. Uh, it is believed that the Firebat was originally intended to be a standalone vehicle, and it was later decided to pair it with the Terradrome. One of the reasons collectors believe that is because of the Firebat's media appearances, and we will talk about that later. The Firebat reminds me a little of the Bell X-1, the first airplane to break the sound barrier in 1947, piloted by Chuck Yeager. Uh, the Firebat doesn't take a lot of design elements from the X-1, but uh, the small size and the single-seater cockpit uh, kind of reminds me of that uh, classic jet. With its vertical wings, it has some resemblance to the Martin Marietta X-24A. There was a 2008 re-release of the Firebat that is very similar to the original 1986 version, even in color. To tell if it's a 1986 or a 2008 Firebat, take a look at the underside of the wings. On the 1986 version, the underside 
outside of the wings are very plain. On the 2008 Firebat, they added some molded detail under the wings. The maroon color of the Firebat contrasts very nicely with the white, gray, and blue of the Terradrome. It's a nice, warm, complementary color against the gray and the blue. And when it's perched inside the launch silo, it adds some color interest to the Terradrome. Let's look at the parts and the features of the Firebat. Starting in the front, we have a rounded nose. We have an opening canopy. Uh, we have on the canopy the infrared HUD heads-up display imaging. It's a radar screen projected onto the canopy. Inside the cockpit, we have some good detail. There's no joystick or yoke, but that's typical. Most G.I. Joe jets did not have a control stick or any other obvious way for the pilot to fly the jet. Uh, but we do have some good detail in there. There's a divider here right at the pilot's feet. Deep inside the cockpit, behind the pilot's head, we have what looks like an air in intake for the jet. And of course, this would not work. You would not want an air intake right behind the pilot's head or inside the cockpit. Uh, I have to assume this is supposed to be something else and not what it appears to be. Uh, it does have these air induction vents on the top, and so maybe that's what the, is supposed to be the air intake for the jet. Let's go ahead and demonstrate how to put the AVAC action figure in the fire bat. And this is where we run into our first problem, either with the fire bat or the action figure. It depends on your point of view. Uh, the AVAC figure came with this black parachute, and it is very difficult to get the AVAC into the fire bat with this parachute on. Uh, the way that I've found is best, if he's wearing the parachute, is to bend his knees as far as they will go, and, uh, and put him in basically in as close to the fetal position as he can get. Um, and then you can pretty much close the canopy, but you're, you have to force it a little bit. Uh, and he is in there, and the canopy does close, uh, but it's a very unnatural uh, pose and a very unnatural position for the uh, pilot. He's not really even sitting in the seat. He's kind of just resting on the parachute pack and his feet. Uh, so this just doesn't work very well. It is much easier to put the AVAC figure in the Firebat without the parachute. Uh, he just fits in there really nicely. It's a little bit narrow still, uh, but there's plenty of room for his legs and his head. You can close the canopy easily, and he fits in there very well. He doesn't uh, flop around too much. He's very secure in there, and that just looks a lot better. We have these horizontal stabilizing front canards, and on the underside we have 25 millimeter twin axial firing cannons and these are frequently missing so if you want a complete fire bat make sure you check the underside and make sure the cannons are still there the fire bat has folding wings that fold up for docking in the Terradrome launch bay and deploy for flight mode on the underside attached to the folding wings we have four bombs they are identical they peg onto the wings with a simple peg and slot uh, and the blueprints call these air-to-surface condor bombs. These condor bombs are very simple. They don't have any detailing at all. They could be based on any number of real-world bombs. They're just generic bombs. The final armament on the Firebat is what the blueprints call high-drag Mark 38 Snake Eye Guidance bombs. And they peg on the underside of the wing with a standard universal dumbbell-shaped peg and slot. Although these are called bombs, they look more like missiles, and I'm sure kids used them as missiles. Uh, there is some detailing that makes them look unique. At a couple places on the Firebat, we have the Cobra Air Corps emblem, which is a standard Cobra emblem with bat wings, and I always liked this. Uh, we first saw this Cobra Air Corps emblem on the 1984 Cobra Rattler, right there. Uh, and unfortunately, it was not used on the 1986 Night Raven, uh, but a modified version of that emblem showed up on the Fang Mark II. Near the back, we have two removable engine covers, uh, best removed by pulling from the top. And once removed, it exposes some engine detail. And then here at the very back, we have the Cobra Jet F404 Afterburning Turbojet, a single jet here in the back. In the back, we have these vertical stabilizers, and attached to them, we have the vertical landing strut wheel assembly. And this is what the Firebat has for landing gear. It does not have landing gear on the fuselage, so it looks like the Firebat is intended to land vertically.
Now let's look at the AVAC, the pilot of the Firebat, and this is a very unique looking pilot figure. If you wanted an AVAC and a Firebat without getting a Terrordrome, you could get them both as a mail away offer in 1988. Here is AVAC in the pantheon of Cobra pilots up to 1986. There are not many. Cobra did have some aircraft that did not come with pilot action figures. In 1983 you had the Cobra Viper Glider pilot. In 1984 you had Wild Weasel, the pilot of the Cobra Rattler, and of course in 1986 you had the AVAC and you also had the Strato Viper, the pilot of the Cobra Night Raven. What exactly does AVAC, A-V-A-C, stand for? Believe it or not, there's nothing on the packaging or the file card that gives you any hint of what AVAC means. It's an acronym for something we know not what. There is a 2008 modern AVAC action figure file card that says it stands for Air Viper Advanced class. And that's as good a name as any, but since the file card was released after the vintage era, I consider it to be a post hoc answer to that question. Let's take a look at AVAC's accessory. He came with one, a non-working black parachute. Uh, it attached at the sides. You can unbuckle it and pull it over his head to remove it. This parachute pack is bulky and makes it difficult to fit the AVAC in the fire bat, as we have seen. Uh, but it is very nicely done with some excellent sculpted detail on the reserve chute there. We have a knife and what looks like maybe a radio here. Uh, and on the back, on the parachute pack itself, uh, we have a nicely sculpted Cobra emblem. Uh, really well done. This non-functioning parachute pack is similar to the one that came with the 1984 ripcord. Now the details and the design are different, but the general idea is the same. Of course, G.I. Joe did have actual functioning parachutes like the 1985 Mail Away parachute pack, uh, but but of course uh, the AVAC would not be able to fit in the Firebat with a real functioning parachute. Um, he barely fits in with the non-functioning one that he comes with. If they wanted AVAC to have a parachute, they could have solved that problem by giving the Firebat a removable ejector seat with a parachute like the Sky Striker. But the file card for the AVAC explicitly states that the Firebat does not have that feature. Let's look at the articulation on the AVAC. He had the standard articulation for 1986 G.I. Joe action figures. That means he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. His neck was on a ball joint. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow. He could move at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. The figure was held together with a rubber o-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. Uh, he could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of the AVAC starting with his head and right off the bat we have some weirdness. He has uh, this bullet shaped helmet that looks a little reminiscent of the 1970s G.I. Joe Bullet Man uh, and it's a very strangely shaped helmet. This helmet doesn't look like it is shaped for a human head. It looks more like a robot head. We have silver paint and you always have to worry about paint wear with that silver paint. We have black goggles. On his chest he has a red flight suit reminiscent of Wild Weasel. Uh, we have a silver chest plate and of course uh, that continues around to the back with a black Cobra symbol on it. Looks really good. Uh, we have a silver collar and silver shoulder pads. Uh, we have some silver shoulder guards here on his arms and that, uh, that red flight suit. Then we have some black gloves with some silver lining and details on them. His waist piece is red and he has a black belt and some silver details. Down his legs he has that red flight suit and he has what I guess are silver pads on his thighs and then on his left leg he has a black pistol and a silver holster. I used to think these pistols on the left side was an indication that the character was left-handed but that wouldn't make any sense with an army builder. You wouldn't have all left-handed pilots. So now I think that these left-handed pistols were really just put there uh, just for aesthetic reasons by the designer and there's no other hidden meaning behind them. He has silver shin pads and black boots with silver braces and one thing that I find very strange is that his feet are sculpted pointed slightly upward. I have to assume they did this as an effort uh, to get him to fit in the fire bat a little better but when he is standing flat footed he's tilted forward. Let's take a look at AVAC's file card. It has his code name as AVAC with no clue about what that means. Uh, it says he's the Cobra
Cobra Terrodrome Firebat Pilot. And this paragraph says, Piloting a Firebat is somewhat akin to strapping yourself onto a cannonball. The cockpit is cramped by any standard and utterly lacking in even the kindest amenities. No engine status display, no weather instruments, no navigation aids, and no ejection seat. Just the basic flight panel, throttle, pedals, and stick. But after the initial high G's of vertical takeoff, the Firebat levels out to become the fastest, most responsive single-seat fighter in the Cobra arsenal. This second paragraph says, AVAC pilots are drawn from the Air Viper pool. And this is the second file card to mention Air Vipers. The Strato Viper file card also mentions Air Vipers. But there was no Air Viper action figure released in the vintage line. The first Air Viper figure was released in 2003, so it will not be reviewed on this channel because it is not vintage. Uh, but it was just a repaint of Vapor, the Cobra Hurricane VTOL pilot from 1990. I will eventually review that figure, but I can tell you in advance I'm not a fan of it. They must be capable of complex mental calculations to make up for lack of onboard computers and absolutely fearless to cope with the Firebat's basic unforgiving nature. The aircraft is not what you would call user-friendly. Surprisingly, there is no lack of recruits for the program. All the best fighter jocks want to ride on the the pocket rocket. The pocket rocket. The Terradrome, the Firebat, and AVAC all made G.I. Joe media appearances, but the Firebat deserves a little extra attention because of when it first appeared in the G.I. Joe cartoon series. The Firebat first appeared in the episode Lights, Camera, Cobra. It was colored gray instead of maroon or red. That episode aired on October 10, 1985, the year before the Terradrome and the Firebat were released as toys. This has fueled speculation that the Firebat was first intended as a standalone alone vehicle. By season two of the cartoon series, in the episode Once Upon a Joe, the Firebat had its toy accurate red color. In that episode though, the Firebat was flown by Strato Vipers. The Terradrome appeared in the opening for episodes in the Sunbow series season two. It was depicted as a larger base than is represented by the toy. In the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie, it was even bigger, with plenty of space inside to house the bulk of Cobra forces. It was infiltrated by Pythona of Cobra Law and by Sergeant Slaughter's Renegades with Falcon. AVAC first appeared in the episode The Phantom Brigade, a 1985 episode, the year before the toy was released. He made a few other appearances, but not many. In the G.I. Joe comic book series, the Terradrome made a brief appearance in issue number 45, but we got a better look at it in issue number 46, the issue in which the Joes infiltrated Cobra Island to rescue Ripcord. What they didn't know was Zartan in disguise had changed places with Ripcord. Several later comic book issues are dedicated to the Joes attempting to gather intelligence about Cobra's launch base. Issue number 54 shows Snake Eyes, disguised as Flint, intentionally getting captured so he can get inside the base. The Joes send a rescue team in issue number 55. In number 56, they set up an elaborate scheme to smuggle Terradrome parts out of the jungle. The intrigue can continues in issue number 58, where Dusty and Mainframe get computer data from a Terradrome. In issue number 68, it is revealed that Cobra is using its Terradrome to transmit paranoia-inducing low-frequency radio waves. They are using a device that first appeared in issue number 2, the first appearance of Quinn. It was a nice callback to an early issue. The Firebat first appeared in issue number 46, where the Firebat is used as a computer-piloted drone jet. Ripcord, disguised as Zartan, is placed in the Firebat so he can escape Cobra Island. AVAC first appeared in issue number 54, where he had an exciting dogfight against Slipstream in the Conquest X-30. Looking at the Terradrome overall, this is a top-tier playset by any measure. It's not perfect, but its assets far outweigh its flaws. It is smaller than the 1985 G.I. Joe aircraft carrier, the USS Flag. In fact, the Terradrome could rest on the Flag deck, 
but nothing is as big as the USS Flag. The Terrodrome does outsize other comparable playsets. The 1983 G.I. Joe Headquarters Command Center is a bit wider at the base, but the Terrodrome is a bit deeper, much taller, and much larger in overall volume. Looking at the play features, there is some redundancy, with three of the rooms housing exactly the same refueling equipment and the computer consoles being used multiple times. But despite this, the Terradrome is loaded with play features. The gun turrets are massive. The pop-up launch bay is exceptional. Uh, the refueling and repair stations give you a chance to repair your Hiss tanks or your Cobra stuns after G.I. Joe has shot a few holes in them. And it even comes with a bonus vehicle. But it doesn't matter what I say about the Terradrome because it's the Terradrome! That's all you need to say, it's the Terradrome! Every G.I. Joe fan knows what that is and knows what that means. You just have to walk up to a guy and say, hey, I got the Terradrome. And that guy's like, the Terradrome. And then you're like, bro. Unless it's a woman collector, in which case you say, sis, Terradrome! I love you, Terradrome. <gasps> Wait! I can explain! Looking at the Firebat overall, I'm going to call the Firebat a top-tier vehicle in its size class. Of course, the Sky Striker would be rated higher, but it's bigger, it had more features. Even the Conquest X-30 was a bit bigger and had more features, but the Firebat is in size closer to the Skyhawk. And in that size class, the Firebat really shines with some great features, the nice fold-out wings, the removable engine covers. It's really fun to play with. Even though the Firebat is a small jet, it has enough firepower to scrap with the Conquest X-30. And it's more than a match for smaller air vehicles like the Skyhawk. It has an impressive number of features in a compact vehicle, and I even like the color. Looking at the AVAC overall, the best I can do is the middle tier for this figure. Although it is designed to look like a deluxe figure with all the silver paint, I think the silver may have been overused. And that odd shaped helmet is a bit of a problem for me. It is a nice looking figure and he definitely stands out in a crowd but he does not make my list of favorite Cobra Troopers. The figure looks a little better with the parachute on. That black adds a bit of depth to the overall look of the figure, but the figure itself to me looks more like a robot than a pilot. That's it. That's the first review of 2017, and we did a great one, the Terror Drone. If you like this and you'd like to see more of this stuff, you can help me make more of this stuff. Just do a few things for me. Make sure you like this video on YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, share this video, that's what helps this channel grow. Support this channel on Patreon for some special perks, and thanks to all my patrons. Don't forget to check out hcc788.com. This video will be on there along with all my other reviews. Thank you for watching. We'll have another Vintage G.I. Joe toy review next week. I'll see you then, and until next time, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. That's going to catch on. Imagine this! Deep in the jungle, you discover it. The Cobra launch base with gun emplacements almost everywhere and special bays for refueling vehicles. There it is! The Cobra launch base is really incredible. That's Dr. Mindbender. And now, look, they captured friends. It's time to warn the Joes, but suddenly they launch the Firebat. Live the adventure of G.I. Joe. Cobra launch base comes with Firebat and Pilot. Other figures and equipment sold separately. Yeah.